<laughs> hey, welcome to the Sink of Truth podcast. Mark Schler alongside Mike Evans. However, you may be listening to us. Thank you so much. Thank you for subscribing, doing all the things you do. And Mike, it's great to have you back. Richie Carney uh, filled in. He was great on the fill in, but man, I missed you. But listen, safety first. I mean, for you, it's all about the prostate and it's uncanny how many times you go to the doctor to see, to have your prostate. Like you've got, you and your, your, uh, your doctor have a very special bond, a very special relationship when it comes to your prostate. What? I, I, I thought everybody goes to get their prostate checked six times a year. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm the only no. one. No. Hey, Doc, I think we better check this thing out again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this time, use the big hand. All right. Um, anyhow, anyhow. Hey, great to- you don't need to take the class ring off this time. Come on now. <laughs> right, right. What do you think? I'm some type of amateur? <laughs> anyhow, man, it's great to have you back. Yeah. I, uh, I missed you. And um, by the way, once again, you never cease to amaze me. You are absolutely horrible at picking oh. NFL games against the spread. But that's for on that's the, yeah. we'll do that on Thursday. But right now, man, how are you, buddy? Great I, to have you back. Uh, yeah, it's good to be back. And and boy, even missing one week, nothing changes, right? It seems like every single week we get together. And I'm telling you, come on, Mark, the Chiefs can't keep doing this. They yeah. can't keep living on the edge. Yet they still do, and they probably took the cake this last one, getting a field goal block to win the game when everybody understood the only way they could win was to block the field goal, and they did. Yeah, that's a failure on Sean Payton. That's a failure on the coaching staff of the Denver Broncos because, you know, you look at it like, oh, my gosh, what a great game plan. And Dave, uh, what's the the special team team coach? Taub, Taub. Taub, or whatever it is. So So you're like, oh, man, that guy's a genius, and he's like – Go back through, and it's all over the internet right now. So go back through and just watch how many times their left tackle, kid by the name of Alex Forsythe, has gotten his ass kicked at that position. I played that position six years in Denver. I was the left tackle. I can't remember ever getting knocked on my ass. That dude gets knocked on his ass. Every single time. So it wasn't just the Kansas City Chiefs had found a weakness, right? They're like, hey, we found something. It is evident for week after week after week after week after week, whether it's the Chargers, the Raiders, the Saints, the the Baltimore Ravens, the Carolina Panthers, everybody knocks number 54 on his ass. And the fact that that guy is still playing for you is a malfeasance of coaching. There were some that they they drove through him like shit through a goose so fast that they actually went beyond the field goal block. Like they were on the other side. Like it went too quick. They were, whoo, like It was like a, a scene out of, uh, what was that airplane movie? You know, the fighter pilot movie? Uh, you mean Top Gun? Yeah, Top Gun is like, hey, we're going to hit the brakes. We're going to hit the brakes. Fly right by. You know, it was it was exactly right. They, they fly right by the potential block, Mike. It, it is, it, it's, there's no excuse for what has gone on. And the fact that that guy is still playing that position when he gets his ass kicked every single time, again, that unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable, and a failure of the coach. This loss is on Sean Payton and the and the Denver Broncos coaching staff. 100% without equivocation, it is their fault. Still, Chiefs did have to make the play because whereas there were a lot of near misses for the Broncos this year, this was the first time they'd had a kick blocked. So yeah. there's something about the Chiefs' ability to do this, and they did it against the Broncos last year. In a game, they blocked a field goal. And how about in the Super Bowl, uh, kick uh, blocking an extra point that kept the game a three-point deficit. So this yeah. is something that they really excel at. Yeah, they're. I mean, the one thing I've said about the Chiefs, and I've said this all year and probably a couple of years, when they have to have a critical play, when they need to make a critical play, Somebody on that football team makes it. I remember a game this year against Atlanta when it was a like a fourth and one, and I think it was a fourth and one, and Nick Bolton flies through the line of scrimmage and makes a tackle in the backfield and stops them from getting a first down. It's it's Patrick Mahomes in overtime against Tampa Bay, and they lose the coin toss. And what happens? I mean, 
as soon as Baker Mayfield sees it, it goes to Kansas City, just rolls his eyes in the back of his head, throws his head back. He's like, we just lost because Mahomes is going to get the ball. And then in that situation, 35-yard chip shot, and they're able to block that field goal. It's just it's one of those things. They're that good. But I will say this, Mike, going back through the defensive tape of the Broncos, man, that was a clinic that they put on. A clinic. So in the 42 drop back pass, I think it was 42. It might have been 48. I can't remember. But I think it was 42 or 40 whatever-ish. 40-ish. How about that? That that covers us all. Like that 40-ish goes from 40 to 50. You've always like, been a big ish guy for I'm a huge ish guy. June ish or that yeah. guy. Middle ish of June. Yeah, that type of thing. So if you get 40 ish attempts, which they had, the Broncos played just cover one with, with pressure. So basically man to man across the board with one single high safety who is who's got the ability to roam, so to speak. Um, and they brought the middle linebacker who's usually a whole defender. They brought pressure on him. They played that of those 40 ish dropbacks. 19 times, like 19 times, they were in straight man-to-man coverage. Our guys are going to lock up against your guys, and they did it exceptionally well. And then their defensive fronts is really hard when you mix up your defensive fronts and you never know which of the, which of the you know four or five guys or eight guys on the line of scrimmage, whatever it is, you know the linebackers and all that. How many? Which guys are coming? It's a lot of simulated pressures, but it'll come from one edge, the opposite edge. It'll come up the middle. All those things. And they really, I'm not even going to call it rattled Patrick Mahomes. I'm not going to say they rattled him, but they were on him with pressure so often. They got him four times. They sacked him four times. They had him wrapped up another two or three times where he escaped him. But I think the thing that happened for me, Mike, was watching him get sped up in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So even when he was protected, you could see he was off. Timing was off, and he got off a couple of reads that became wide-open touchdown throws that he could have made that he missed because he was sped up mechanically from all the pressure that he was receiving. They did a great job of changing things up, getting him with a rush up the middle. Um, They did a lot of things exceptionally well. The Broncos really have their number. We were talking on our radio show this morning, Andrew Mason, who joins us on our radio program. He writes for uh, DenverSports.com. He he joined us and said two is the number. And we had to guess what the what it meant Two, And I had no clue. Like, I'm, I'm like, I just throw out stupid stuff. Right. Because I had no clue. But go ahead and explain what the two was, Mike, because I thought this was fascinating. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. I am. Okay. So uh, am you know what? I set okay. you up and well, because you, you were you, using somebody else's intellectual. You, you were still you weren't you, using mine. So. Right. Yeah. You were still, still daydreaming. You about were still daydreaming about the big fingers of your proctologist. <laughs> so like, yeah, I get it. I get it. You were lost in thought. Oh my gosh. She's so handsome. And his hands are so strong. Um, so anyhow, two was, two was in the last three games against the Kansas City Chiefs, the Denver Broncos have given up, count them, two touchdowns. Yeah. Three games to that vaunted offense with that quarterback who everybody thinks is the, you know, the current GOAT, two total touchdowns. Is it a blueprint? Sure. Does everybody have the same personnel and the same ability and the same you know structure? No, they don't. But at least you can draw some things off of that and see if you can have you know an opportunity to really challenge them. And in Buffalo, you know that's what's going to go down. Yep. They're going to Buffalo to play the Bills. The pill, the Bills right now, or whatever they are, eight and two, eight or two. whatever they are. Um, this will be an interesting matchup. Could it be the Kansas City Chiefs' first loss? Let's hope so. I pray, you know, from my lips to God's ears, let's hope it's their first loss. So the the Chiefs once again escape. How about the Lions? Did the Lions, in winning ugly, did did they show just how formidable they're going to be the rest of the way, that they can play as badly as they played? Jared Goff becoming only the fourth quarterback in football history. This goes back to the, the 40s. First quarter, uh, only the fourth quarterback in um, in history to throw five interceptions and still win. Yeah, I- incredible. Like I looked at this game and I thought, I thought instead of going wow, like they really played a poor game, and like I would looked at it like this is this is a key cog to a championship run. 
when you can play your worst game, the worst game you've played, when you can show up and not match the intensity of the other team and the other team is playing desperate football and you don't have that in you. Like you cannot play 17, 18 weeks, whatever it is, you get a bye week, call it 18 weeks, call it 17 weeks. You can't play 17 weeks on adrenaline. I'm sorry, you can't. And sometimes you walk into a buzzsaw and they walked into a buzzsaw in Houston and they got their asses kicked for three quarters until the fourth quarter happened. And I think a couple of things happened for me. Okay. Jared Goff obviously throws five picks. Um, inexplicable. Like, I mean, he has been so good for so long. He just has one of those games where it just doesn't go his way and some tip balls and some other things that happen, but five picks, like, like you can't write that script. And yet you're down two scores going into the fourth quarter and a couple of things that just resonated with me in that fourth quarter, their offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, never quit running the ball. As a matter of fact, he doubled down on run. He doubled down on running the ball. He started handing it to Gibbs. Gibbs gets a couple of rip offs on 18 wide zone, 18 handoff, 18 force, 18 pitch, you know, all the, so they get a couple of, a uh, big time kind of chunk yardage, 12, 14 yards running to the right hand side, then to the left hand side. And he never gives up on that. And that, continues to allow the play action to be effective. And the next thing you know, what happens? Next thing you know, they score a touchdown, then bam, they're right back in it. They end up kicking two field goals on two drives at the end of the game to seal the victory, right? Like those are the things when you know you're really good. You walk away from that game, man, and you feel wounded as a great team. Like, man, we really let ourselves down. Man, we really didn't show up. Man, that really sucked. And you can get a lot of, uh, like, there'll be a lot of teaching tape for Dan Campbell with, with his football team. But the bottom line is you still found a way to win. Mm -hmm. You're still good enough to overcome five freaking turnovers. Now you turn the ball over on them several times as well, but five interceptions and still found a way to win a football game. Like that just flat doesn't happen. I mean, you mentioned it. It was only what the fourth time in his, in the history of the NFL that somebody has been able to do that. And, and, And to me, like a lot of people are like, oh, is there is there something wrong? Is this the first, you know, is is Detroit vulnerable? Is this whatever? Is this, uh, you know, is there a chink in the armor? All those different things that people will talk about. And I looked at this like, wow, that's a freaking good football team. When you can play your worst football game and it, at nut cutting time, you can go, all right. Time to buckle down, boys. Let's go find a way to look, find a way to win this football game. Which that's what great not that's what championship caliber teams find a way to do, and they did it. Stink. What is Russell Wilson bringing to the Steelers' offense that Justin Fields wasn't? Uh, a, a vertical passing game. Bringing a vertical passing game, and I'm I'm telling you. Um, it's been impressive. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm the first one to tell you, man, he was awful in Denver. For two seasons, he was absolutely awful. And, you know, he's got to own that. But I think, the, I think what has gone on in Pittsburgh is here's a guy that's so incredibly in tune with his legacy. And I really have to believe that he had this, you know, come to Jesus meeting with himself on where he was in his career and the things that he was trying to do here and toward the end of his career in Seattle and said, that's not my strength. And there's like, man, I have said this repeatedly and you'll, you, you, you've got my back on this. I know there are things that he does exceptionally well. And then there are things that he doesn't do well at all. And live in the realm of it's okay not to be great at everything. Like that's what makes that's what makes us great. You and I are really close friends. We have different idiosyncrasies. There are different strengths that you have that I don't have, and there are strengths that I have that you don't have. And it's what makes the relationship work. It's like marriage. And for Russell Wilson to finally go, okay, listen, how am I going to get back to being what I've always been? And like what Pittsburgh has done and what Mike Tomlin has done and Arthur Smith, their offensive coordinator, everything that he throws is outside the numbers. Watch the quick passing game. There is nothing. I put the, I put his passing charts together. Literally the middle of the field 
doesn't exist. They don't throw the ball there. And that's where he's had tip balls. That's where he's had incompletions. That's where he's gotten himself into trouble. So everything in the quick passing game is outside the numbers. And then the deep ball. And Russell has never lost the ability to throw the deep ball. He's been great. The other thing that he has done is he's done a really good job with the boot keep game, getting outside the pocket. They've run the ball well, really accepting that role and saying, hey, man, let me eliminate half the field instead of being, I'm getting control of everything and I can get, you know, all those concepts. No, get him outside. And he has accepted this. He is playing exceptional football. And, um, you know, I've said it on this podcast. I'll say it again. I have, without equivocation, man, good for Russell Wilson, right? Good for Russell Wilson. And uh, I was like, I looked at it like he was completely done. I was wrong, man. He's playing really good football right now. And he had a couple of throws. Now, George Pickens made an unbelievable catch in the end zone, which wasn't the best throw that Russell Wilson had. I mean, he only completed 50% of his passes, right? So it wasn't like he had an incredibly effective day, but he made a couple of four or five big time throws. He had a scramble on second down and 16 in the last touchdown drive that saved them. He scrambled around, scrambled around, and they made the throw. I think they got, got them the first down. Then he had the throw to Mike Williams on a, you know, on a, like, I can't understand. St. Juice was eight, 10 yards off the ball and he still got ran by. Like, how, how do you let that happen? But the bottom line is Russell on a blitz. And I think that's how it happens. He just figures that Mike that Mike Williams is going to cut off the route, right? So he's kind of playing flat-footed because they're bringing pressure, and Russell evades the pressure, drops back a little bit, and throws a moon ball. And Mike Williams runs under it for a touchdown. It was an incredible throw, uh, an incredible read, and and that's what Russell has done. So um, I don't know if you saw this, but when they got Washington to jump off sides at the very end of the game, which was – Again, inexplicable because you know that's exactly what's going on. A rookie jumps off sides. All 11 guys that were on the field, man, are celebrating together. And it's amazing what you can do as a team when, uh, you know, you can ce- celebrate the success of others like it's your own when when you don't care who gets the credit. Like that, Pittsburgh's tied together, man. They're they're fun to watch. Well, are they? Are they they're fun to watch. Are they a Super Bowl contender? Absolutely. Yeah. One, they're going to play great defense, right? Two, they're going to run the ball. They're going to find a way to run the ball, play a physical style. Like one thing I'll tell you about Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh knows exactly who they are Mm -hmm. and more importantly, who they aren't. Right. And so it is your coach's responsibility to establish the identity of your football team. This is who we are. This is what we do. And Mike Mike Tomlin, coach of the year, man. Mike Tomlin has said, this is what we're going to do. And by the way, there were people within that organization that were like, do not, they, Justin Fields is playing really good for us. We're four and two. Don't get away from Justin mm-hmm. Fields. There were people that disagreed with Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin just had the mic drop. He said, man, this is why I get paid the big bucks. I'm moving to Russell Wilson. It gives us a better chance. And again, I'm wrong. He's right. He's smart. I'm dumb. You know, there's and, and like, Good for him and good for the Steelers, man. And as you know, a lot of Steeler fans are a lot of rust. Uh, I shouldn't call them Steeler fans. I should call them rusties. A lot of the rusties out there are very angry with me. Um, and I understand that. But I've been a Steeler fan my entire life. And I'm excited. I'm excited to see them play well. And truth, truth be told, I, as pissed off as I was at Russell Wilson for all the crap that went down in Denver, I'm actually excited for him. I'm, I'm not rooting against him. I think it's a cool story, man. Maybe a little bit. I'm rooting. Maybe a little bit. It's just a smith. No, I no. I'm I'm excited, man. They're, I love the Steelers. So uh, I, they're they're playing great football right now. It's really exciting. Yes. Well, you're happy, and Steeler fans are happy. I'm sure Bronco fans would uh, love to get maybe a little bit of a rebate, a little refund there from uh, from Russ for those two years that uh, he inflicted quite a bit of damage. Um, we all thought Aaron Rodgers said the Jets was going to be a great story. And it has been a disaster. It has been yeah. a debacle. Take the word that you want to use to describe it. It's been that bad. Does he come back next year? Should he come back next year? Or should he hang it up? No, you just mentioned the Denver Broncos, okay? And, like, Russ did not work 
in Denver, and it was never going to work with him and Sean Payton, oil and water. And you could sit there and argue that Sean should have changed his offense and been more like Arthur Smith or whatever. You could argue. We said from day one that it was going to be a good fit in Pittsburgh with Arthur Mm -hmm. Smith. So because of the style of offense with which he runs, okay, Uh, it was never a good fit. And we can blame the Broncos and we can blame the Broncos for giving him all that money. We can blame Russ for not playing well. Like there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, But the, the bottom line is the Jets need to take a lesson from the Broncos. Rip off the Band-Aid. The Broncos are sitting on $84 million with a dead cap. And they're sitting at five and five right now with a rookie quarterback who's got the most touchdowns of any rookie quarterback in the National Football League. He's got the most pass attempts. He's got the most uh, the most completions of any rookie quarterback in the NFL right now. How come you're smiling? Because you're giving a thumbs up and some thumbs up. Oh, clouds, is it? Clouds are showing up on the screen. Let me see. Thumbs up. No, it's not doing it now. You gotta hold it. Just hold it. Maybe I'm. There it oh, is. there it is. There. <laughs> hey, look at that! I didn't even notice that. I didn't know we could do that. I didn't know I had that technology. <laughs> <laughs> Matty, does he have Double any thumbs. power? Does he have any other power? Oh, look at this! Did you see? Oh my god! Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Well, let me do that again. Okay, you ready? Oh, do that again. Let me do you again. So, right. Bo Nix right now is one of the front runners for offensive rookie of the year. Oh my God, this is great. Why didn't we just, I feel like we just discovered uh, electricity or something. Oh my gosh, I am I am like the Albert Einstein of video podcasting. Oh my God. What else? What else? What other tricks you have up your sleeve? That didn't do anything. No, do I thought for down. sure that do was going to do something. Do thumbs down. Yeah. Oh, keep the thumbs down. Wait one. a minute. Right. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's raining. It's raining. <laughs> we honestly didn't know we had we could do this. I did not know awesome. the unmitigated power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, just All make right, sure so, you use the power for good. All right. Don't overuse yes, it. Yes. Let's save so it for the, good. So the Jets <laughs> should take a page out of the Broncos playbook, rip off the band-aid. And get rid of Aaron Rodgers. He is washed. He is spent. He wow. is no longer can move. And you know I'm the biggest Aaron Rodgers fan of all time. But dude, it's this 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 exercise is over. It's awful. And you can't bring that guy back. Now it is the Jets. So they'll just screw it up, right? They'll draft another guy and ruin him, whether it's Sam Darnold or Zach Wilson or, you know, bring on the next sacrificial lamb because that's exactly what it is with the Jets. It'll probably always be that way. But you can no longer have – you can't have Aaron Rodgers the head of your organization. I'm right. You, you, at, no. at this point, you got to you got to move on. Like there is not. I mean, uh, two weeks ago, he said he was talking about the cayenne pepper water, and then you know, and then last week it was it was Devonte Adams go. We got that run the table vibe, dude. We got that run. You know, we got that run in your underpants vibe is what I got from you guys because you're shit. Um, you guys are awful, and so like to me, it's it's time to move on. Clean house. Um, Eat it, eat the cap hit, and and try to move on from that garbage because they are they're awful. Well, they're uh, rearranging the tech uh, deck chairs on the uh, SS Chicago Bears ship right now. Shane Waldron is the the first sacrificial lamb to go down. There will be others probably, and then ultimately Matt Eberflus will be be fired because. You can't have your franchise quarterback, the number one pick in the draft, Caleb Williams, regressing as the season goes along. He's not getting better. He's regressing. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many there's so many fingers to point, you know, like when it comes to the way they're playing right now. Matt Eberflus, you're either coaching or you're allowing it to happen. Right. So, you know, guys are talking Jalen Johnson, their outstanding corner, basically came out yesterday on a radio show. They asked him and he's like, yeah, not everybody works hard. Or not everybody is is prepping the way they should prep or whatever. You know, you had the Tyreek Stevenson thing where he turns his back to the play that's going on to 
you know, shout at the, uh, the the fans with Washington and they lose on the uh, Hail Mary pass, right? Then you have the coach, Matt Eberflus, not taking responsibility for the play before the Hail Mary, which is like, you know, uh, he allows, he doesn't protect the sideline. He allows Washington to throw a little out route, 13 yards to gain them the real estate so they could actually throw the Hail Mary. Otherwise, you had to have a hook and lateral play. Right. And so then he doesn't even take responsibility. He said that has no bearing on the Hail Mary. My acid didn't have a bearing on it. They wouldn't have been able to throw it. They'd have been able to throw it down to about the because they threw it to about the three yard line. It got tipped into the end zone. So, you know, you max throw you to still come down at the what at the 15. I mean, give me a break. It had no bearing. If you don't take responsibility for the crap that you put out there, how do you expect the players that you're supposed to be in control of, right? How do you expect the players that you're supposed to lead, the guys that you're setting an example for, if you won't take responsibility, Matt Eberflus, how are they going to be expected to take responsibility? Now you fire, you know, the scapegoat, Shane Waldron, and yes, they've regressed. But I'm going to tell you right now, I went through every sack. They gave up nine last week, nine. And a bunch of them are on Caleb Williams. And it's the thing I talked about, you know, playing off schedule, coming out of college football. And you and I had this conversation, like you've got to learn to fall in love with a profit. you got to learn to fall in love with the first option in your uh, progression. you got to be, be able to learn to fall in love with throwing the check down when things aren't open. Him holding the ball, him patting the ball. I don't care how many times you pat that damn thing. It's not going to burp. It's not a baby. Throw the freaking ball. Like that drives everybody who plays up front crazy. And then the last thing I'll say is when everybody got all excited about Caleb Williams, right? And you remember it, it's a generational talent. He's the best quarterback ever to come out and all this stuff. And what was yours truly saying? You know, he's like, ah, oh, pump your brakes now. Like, mm-hmm. let's let's slow down a little bit. And everybody got all excited because they had, oh, Keenan Allen, and they've got DJ Moore, and they went out and got a Dunze, and they've got Komet at tight end. And the weapons, the weapons, the weapons, ooh, the weapons. And I'm like, dude, you build a team from the out, the, from the inside out, not the outside in. And you can have all the weapons in the world. If you can't block people, does not matter. And here it comes. 38 sacks taken on the season so far. 38 sacks. And a lot of them, Caleb Williams' fault. There's no question about that. So he's got to be a lot better. But you fire Shane Waldron, okay? Great. Who replaces him? I think it's Thomas uh, Thomas Brown, I think is the name uh, that uh, – that replaces him. Who is Thomas Brown? Well, he was the Carolina Panthers offensive coordinator last year who got demoted from being the offensive coordinator. Then he got hired by Chicago to be the passing game coordinator. So you're telling me the answer to Shane Waldron, who you don't think is having enough success, is to hire or promote the guy who is the passing game coordinator who held the offensive coordinator job last year in Carolina only to lose it because you were pathetic at throwing the football and Bryce Young looked like he had been, you know, been set back an eternity. And now all of a sudden Bryce Young is playing and playing a little bit better football here after he's been benched. So like I, like Chicago, come on, this is going to be – it's already a dumpster fire. They're going to fire everybody on the coaching staff, right? But part of this is Ryan Poles as well. Like, I don't, you're an offensive lineman who thinks you're going to win games because you're going to out-talent people in the National Football League. If you don't win a lot of scrimmage, I don't care how good your quarterback is or how good your receivers are or how good your tight end is or how good your running backs are. If you don't control a line of scrimmage in the National Football League, you lose, and that's why they're losing. Another great podcast. Give yourself a thumbs up. Wait. <laughs> this is the greatest thing I have ever discovered. I feel I'm like Magellan. Didn't Magellan discover something? What did Magellan discover? You're a history guy. Uh, Magellan. Magellan was, uh, didn't he cross the sea or something like that? Was he the first? I don't know. Maybe uh, Lewis and Clark. I feel like uh, Lewis and Clark. <laughs> This is awesome. This is awesome. Hey, for everybody involved in the Seek a Truth folks, podcast. Let me just tell you something. It's only going to get worse because now he's, oh he's literally. God. I'm going like to find other things to he's do. He's like a boy with a new toy. So get, get Does ready. Does that do anything? Get ready. Does my moose horns do anything? No, no moose. No mooses. <laughs> what about this? Oh, jeez. Don't do that. No? What about this one? <laughs> Nothing. Damn it. 
I got to find something else. All right, for everybody involved in the Secret Podcast, for Mike, I am Mark. We'll talk to you guys later on the week. <laughs>